kind of it gotten kind used of to it. But You're it, kissing on TV, you like know that my mom's gonna be watching this. Like, the smacking of lips is unlike anything you've ever experienced. The Bachelor is a wild show. And this is my first time meeting the guy. Like, <laughs> I'm not gonna ask him to say, hey, sure, here's my daughter's hand in marriage. I just met you. Oh, by the way, there's another dude. Even if you don't admit to watching it, you've probably caught a few episodes here and there. We all know what we're signing up for. We all know that there's one guy, 30 plus women. Because secretly, people love reality TV. But also, uh, there's a ton of people watching you. Like the, the camera crew of the, the crew on The Bachelor Bachelor, there's hundreds of people. And even if you don't want to, you've definitely wondered what it's really like to be on a show like The Bachelor. The good, the bad, and the ugly. You literally are best friends with the producers. You just start talking and talking and talking. For hours. And little, little do you know, they're, they're just talking in their mic. brainstorming how this could be used and if it could be used. But that's why we love reality yeah. television. So let's dive in and explore the many secrets from the contestants themselves. Before we even get on The Bachelor, there are a few things that you might be wondering. So the big question, is any of it real? Are these people really looking for love? I uh, see. So I we're different. I. You went looking for love. I don't like to say looking for love. I went on very excited, hopeful, and very open to meeting somebody that I could fall in love with. Uh, what? Yeah. Th that happens. No, totally. If you I, would I, watch the show, you would know it happens. That wasn't out of my the realm of thought. Weird shit happens, you know? <laughs> um, but I wasn't like, I'm going to go find my soulmate. I was like, you know, I might travel a little bit, meet some people. It might be fun. Hey, she might be cool. I don't know. I think that's actually a pretty common yeah. thought process when you go into the show. It's like, yeah. let's go and see what happens. As long as you're open, I think that you're good. It seems like most people do believe in the possibility of finding some kind of connection, whether that be love or a quick fling. Of course, there are people like 2019's Jed Wyatt, who seem to only have been on to try and kickstart his music career, but this is more of an outlier. There's no monetary incentive either. The only person who gets paid is the star of the show. According to Amy Kaufman's book, Bachelor Nation, they get paid in the six-figure range. However, none of the other contestants get paid. Depending on your job, you might even need to take a leave of absence or quit altogether, which makes going on the show a risky prospect. For some people, though, leaving their job feels like a good thing. For me, I reminisce on my time before The Bachelor, and I was uh, in a job in a cubicle in a basement. And there was nothing inherently wrong with that, but I wasn't fulfilling any dreams or passions or purposes that I was wanting. I was obviously remodeling houses, and that's something that I do on my own time, but I was also doing sales. Um, and I hated that job, so it was really easy for me to say, I don't need to be doing that, so it was pretty easy for me. Yeah. <laughs> but before you quit your job, first you have to make it through a rigorous casting process. It's all pretty standard interview stuff. You apply, they ask many invasive questions, get a psychologist to perform a personality test, get a private detective to dig up any dirt on you to see if you're a liability with the tabloids, and then they take some of your blood to make sure that you don't have any STDs. Because according to Amy Kaufman's book, that is an immediate disqualification. Okay, so maybe it's not so standard. It's actually incredibly rigorous. Although some journalists argue that it's not quite rigorous enough. There have been contestants that have been convicted of sexual assault and they still ended up being on the show. So perhaps it does need to get more rigorous. But if you get past all of that, you get to experience life on the show. Once you've been selected to take part in the competition, you have about two weeks lead time to pack your bags and fly out to LA. One thing you may not realize when you're watching the show is that contestants have to bring all their own clothes. The show only provides dresses or suits to the final two contestants and only in those last episodes where the star is deciding who they're going to end up with. This puts a lot of pressure on contestants who have been said to spend thousands of dollars on new outfits. Some even taking out a second mortgage on their home to prepare. Throughout the show, you also have to do your own hair and makeup. Once you land in LA, producers take your phone away immediately. It's one of the rules of the show. They're nervous about leaks and also they don't want you to have any contact with the outside world. It's very true. It humanized me a little bit. 
Uh, you, you go from being busy and in a hurry all the time because there's so much going on, there's so much chaos, to your world really slows down because you're in an isolated, controlled environment and there's no distraction except for dating and getting to know somebody else. For me, I personally really enjoyed that. I thought it was great to be able to just focus on building relationships and getting to know somebody the best I could in the condensed time that we had. But it's very true. There is no contact with the outside world. I would say it was harder being on The Bachelor uh, in the full group of girls. That's the first time that you're experiencing it. You, you don't have the music, you don't have TV, you don't have your phone. You really do have to focus on your relationship with the other roommates, the lead. And so that's why people, when they ask, how can it even work? You have so much time to focus on that relationship that it kind of does help speed things up and it gets you to ask the right questions. It just gets you to dive a little bit deeper. The main reason producers do this is that they believe these distractions separate you from the group and the show doesn't want that. They want everyone to be interacting all the time especially in the difficult times. So all contestants are really allowed to do is sit with their thoughts, interact with other contestants, and drink alcohol. The Verge describes this as being in a sort of sensory deprivation tank, which is why, they suggest, competitors seem to get so sensitive, flipping from happy to crying on the drop of a dime. And to top it all off, there's no air conditioning in the mansion because it's too difficult to cut around the sound. The only time contestants get any entertainment or cool air is when being transported from one location to another and the producers decide to turn the radio on in the car. But that's enough about the rules. After you get to the house, the game has officially begun. Your main goal from here on out is to try and form a romantic connection with the star of the show. That all starts with night one. And the most important thing about night one is making a big impression. For viewers at home, night one is also the night where you can start to make good guesses about who's going to last and who won't. Because there are production details that can give you clues. You can always sort of tell, always pay attention to music that they play, always pay attention to a lot of the times, which I think they've changed. It's in the first couple of limo entrances uh, that is gonna be one, someone in the final. And if they show a lot of time with that person early on, they're obviously building their story. So obviously keep I that was, in mind. Uh, oh, I was the first. They aired you first, but, but you I, weren't. In the real world, I was last. Yeah. yeah. And you know, you'll know very early on who they want the villain to be. Yeah. That's pretty obvious, everyone can tell that. Yeah. Yeah. Most people come up with their own ideas for how they're going to enter and the producers work with them to make it happen. The more ridiculous, the better. Sometimes, however, contestants don't have grand ideas and so producers step in to try and punch their stories up a bit. Insider reports that one season, they exaggerated just how much one contestant was into Fifty Shades of Grey. In reality, she hadn't finished the book, but she lied about being completely obsessed with it. From small to big entrances, that first night ends up being really long. They condense it into two hours for viewers, but it's been reported that it can go all night. And especially in the early days where people are plentiful, the rose ceremonies can also extend well into the night. The rose ceremonies are long. They're not 10 hours, you know, especially the first night when you're meeting everyone. That's a long night. You start early on in the evening. You typically don't get done until the next day. It's, it's the little things like the cameras have to reposition. You have to kind of maneuver some people around. It really brings you just some really special, unique memories. But it is very tiring. You know, you're going, going, going. You're trying to follow your heart and your head and get to know all these people in such a short amount of time. So it is um, not easy. It, it takes a lot out of you. Um, but in the end, it's, it's going to be worth it. After that first night, you start going out on dates and you hope to fall in love. So what are the juicy secrets? You might think they cut the show to make people say things they never said or to heighten the drama. But here's what Ben Higgins has to say about it. I've always said there hasn't been a scenario I've watched back uh, as I watch a television show, if I was a part of it, that didn't really happen. You know, it might be condensed and there might be things taken out, but for the most part, the storyline has always been communicated. So if it all plays out as it really happened, what is it actually like deciding between all those people? So you start out on The Bachelorette for me, uh, and you're one of many. You have no clue what's coming up next. Everything's, uh, every day is a surprise. You have no idea when you're gonna be on a date or when you're not. 
so it is difficult. And I think especially early on, it's a culture shock. It's a, it's a world shock for you because you've never probably been in an environment like that before. Uh, as the lead and the bachelor, you pretty much know what's gonna be happening. Uh, you, you know what the days are gonna look like. Uh, you know who you're going on a date with uh, days before. But I do think one of the wildest parts is kind of compartmentalizing each relationship along the way. You kind of put everybody in their own uh, lane and if you've talked to one person and you've kissed that person and you have to go over to talk to somebody else. Now that's all, that works. It, it, many years of the show, you've learned how to do it or many weeks into the show, you kind of get a, a feel for how to do it. The hardest part is watching this back and there's close-ups of you kissing, which nobody wants to see it either way. <laughs> and you definitely don't want your grandma watching that with you. And next time you see a kissing scene, turn up the volume because the smacking of lips is unlike anything you've ever experienced. It's, it's hard for anybody. You really have to go in with the mindset of knowing you're one of money and not letting that get to you because we all know what we're signing up for. We all know that there's one guy, 30 plus women. You kind of just have to do your own thing, journal, have your alone time, get in your own head when you need to. But yeah, as Ben said, when you're the lead and dating multiple men, you do have to compartmentalize. You kind of have to tear them out a little bit. Like I knew early on who my front runners were that I really had those initial strong connections with. But there were so many guys that I still wanted to get to know that really surprised me. So to just, as Ben said, stay in your lane. Now, I know what you're thinking. What are the producers doing during all this time? As the saying goes, the devil works hard, but bachelor producers work harder. You literally are best friends with the producers, and then you start to make friends within the house. So they really get to know a lot about you. Oh, they ask yeah. the questions, they want to know about your past, and like, you have nothing else to do but talk. And so you just start talking and talking and talking. For hours and hours. And you On know, camera little, and off camera as well. You're just having a normal chat with a person. And little do you know, they're, they're just talking in their mic. brainstorming how this could be used and if it could be used in any way that could create drama. And so that's kind of what it is. But that's why we love reality yeah. television. You know, we That's why it's so good. It's so you good. You want to you want to know the, the the nitty and gritty stuff. You want to know it. But it's important to say that the bachelor producers aren't evil. Of course, they embrace any drama they get and try to explore and heighten that drama if at all possible so that the show is more exciting. But Katie Chen Mazzara again states in her interview with Wit and Ray that producers can't always be the bad guy. They can't be out to get contestants because if they were, contestants would never trust them. They have to feel like the producers have their backs so that they can feel comfortable looking for love. However, as you might guess, there have been cases where producer interaction has directly tried to steer the show. So one thing happened on our season, so when it was down to two and you like meet her family, like, so they're all prepping me up, like, oh, you get to sit down with her dad. Like, this is where you got to ask, like, for her hand in marriage. And like, this is how it goes. And I'm like, I'm not going to, this is my first time meeting the guy. Like, I'm not going to ask him to say, hey, sure, here's my daughter's hand in marriage. I just met you. Oh, by the way, there's another dude that I'm about to meet. Oh, no, by the way, I haven't even talked to my daughter yet. So I was like, no, I don't think, uh, like, I'm not going to do it. And they're like, whoa, that was not cool. They're like, you have to. I'm like, not going to do it. So I didn't. I made sure to sit down with Joseph, who I love. Joseph, love you. Um, love and told him how much I've cared about his daughter, blah, blah, blah. Not blah, blah, it was very serious. Uh, and then after the fact, like a week later, by the time we're getting closer to like the actual finale, I was like, you know what? I think I'm gonna do this. Like, I think actually I'm gonna propose. So I asked one of the producers like, hey, can I talk to her parents? Like, can we get them on the phone? And the response was, no, you missed your chance. And I was like- You didn't like that? You didn't oh, like I someone- missed, oh, I oh, missed my you, chance. You see this guy? Oh, I did, okay. So I was like, here's what's gonna happen. So let's have a powwow, all the producers. Jordan's here. calling the shots at this I point now, like, by the way. Filming, here's what's gonna happen. Oh gosh. Um, but then, no, really, I was like, hey, I get it. I know that you want some drama at the end, but this is actually gonna be a real part of our relationship. And, and if you guys are affecting the real part, that's not cool with me. So either get them on the phone or I'm gonna walk. You don't always have to script that drama. No. The, the drama happens when you're in a house with that many people. I mean, has anybody cried more than her? Like on a TV show. Well, you wouldn't ever. know because you don't watch reality television, but I did I cry assumed. a lot. <laughs> Those producers, they know what they're doing. They need a raise. They don't even have to like script it. They just say, okay, I'm gonna put you guys together and I'm just gonna let Watch it brew. Out. Now, let's get into the nitty gritty. So what happens when you get dumped on the show? Well, they send you home pretty immediately. Unless you're the second or third runner up, then they keep you on set for a couple days to keep spoilers at bay. 
Producers have no influence on who stays and who should go because, again, they want you to feel like they're on your side. So if the villain stays on for a really long time, that's because the star wanted it that way. If you make it all the way to the fantasy suites, those are the first times that the couples actually get to spend quality time together not in front of cameras. So not much is known about what goes on in there unless contestants are vocal about it. If you get to the end of the show and you get engaged, congrats! You're offered to have the wedding on live TV and have the show pay for everything. The show even purchases the engagement ring for you. But if you end up breaking up within two years, you have to give it back. The hope is that you don't break up though. Whether or not you win or get dumped, after filming ends, you experience life after The Bachelor. You have to stay in hiding for a bit until the show airs, at which point you achieve some level of celebrity, depending on how long you stayed on the show. If you won and you're still with your partner, it can be amazing and perhaps a little awkward. The, the weirdest part is sometimes you're watching it back with the person that you chose. And of course, you're still in hiding at that point, so you can't go out in public and talk openly with them about it. But they're watching it back and watching you kiss other people. That's the weird part for me, at least for me. And Garrett did a great job of just being very okay with where we were currently at in our relationship and knowing that he was the final one and that it was just the two of us at that point. But it's not fun watching you kiss your exes with your current partner. If you didn't last that long, the first option is to go back to living your regular life. Go back to the job you had before if you can or start looking for a new one. One former Bachelor contestant says that this can be really difficult. He told MarketWatch, I didn't understand the magnitude of the show and how hard it is to get a real job right after. Everyone knows who you are and employers see it as a distraction. Despite that unlucky consequence, there are other options. If you stay single, you might be able to continue along the path to Bachelor in Paradise. This way, you get a second chance at finding love and you get to stay in the public consciousness a little longer. This could be especially helpful if you're strategic about it, as you can parlay your fame into becoming an influencer for brands. Depending on how many social media followers you get, you may or may not be able to make that your main gig. But the best alternative to losing on the show is becoming the next Bachelor or Bachelorette. This is usually picked from whomever was the fan favorites from the previous season. But if those options aren't on the table for you, you might still be able to use your Bachelor fame to launch yourself into a new career. We have, we have the opportunity because of our platform from the show to like work to, together. And, to and host shows yeah. like Battle of the Fittest Couples and do stuff like this. And, and I feel like being able to meet the way that we did and take people back into our lives now when we're doing something we already love and we're and passionate about, it's cool. Yeah. We like it. The show has launched me into the ability now to be in front of people, to be talking to people, to be uh, involved in really fun, exciting projects like this Bachelor Live. Um, I would have never been able to do this without the show. Uh, and now I have a coffee company that I operate. I would never have been able to do that without the show. That's what excites me now. And I get to do that only because of the show. So after learning all that, would you want to be on The Bachelor? Would I recommend going on reality TV? You're um, I'm, I'm actually interested. Well, in no, I, I would 1,000% tell you to do The Bachelor, Bachelorette. I don't know about all the other yeah, shows. Because some you of those like are. You like watching them? I love you watching them. You would love to them. see those people in public. I like love saw. watching them. I don't know how they feel. They probably love it, but like, I'm sure there's a lot of people who probably hated their time on reality TV. Maybe. My experience has been great. I would tell you to do it if it's what you want to do. What about you? I'd say go for it. It's fun. Yeah, it's a short life. Just be yourself. Yeah. Have fun. Why not? Right? YOLO. YOLO. People aren't saying that anymore. YOLO. So You're just leaving me like, hanging. It was a thing like years ago. It's not anymore. So, JOMO is though. It's not a thing. Oh. Is that a wrap? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you made it this far, thank you so much for checking out this video. Make sure to like and subscribe. It really helps us out in creating awesome content like this. If you're looking for more nuance, we've left some links in the description below for the articles that we use when researching this video. 